This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. War ravaging the East since 1937 and Japan's invasion of China reached Europe on the 1st of September 1939 with Germany's invasion of Poland. It became global on the 7th of December 1941 when Japanese aircraft attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. It touched every continent and lasted for six years. It ended with a new weapon for a new age. This is the history of the greatest of all man-made events. These men are part of that history. They are eyewitnesses to the triumphs and tragedies of the war wherever it was fought. Their testimony is part of the story of how our world was made. By those who could pay, and those who could no longer meet. The price of empire. In the middle of 1942, the war in Europe would reach its halfway point and its turning point. It had taken Hitler half a war to occupy a tenth of the world's surface and control a population roughly equivalent to that of the United States of America. Half a war to gain an empire. It would take him half a war to lose one. Japan also reached the halfway point with a vast empire. It had scorched across the Asia-Pacific region until it occupied a sixth of the Earth's surface. Then it too started the tumble towards destruction. It is inconceivable, Winston Churchill had declared in 1925, that in our lifetime and in that of our children, Japan could pose a threat to the security of the British Empire in the East. As late as 1939, he was being reassuring about possible Japanese designs on Singapore. There will, he promised, be no attack in any period which our foresight can measure. But there was. The southern resources area was vital to Japan. The price of silk, still Japan's principal export, had dropped by 50% since the Great Depression, and she was resource poor. Something had to be done. By 1938, military spending absorbed 75% of Japanese government expenditure. She launched not one attack, but many. The United States lost the use of all of its Pacific battleships and large numbers of cruisers and destroyers. The British and Dutch Far Eastern fleets had been eliminated, and the Royal Australian Navy had been driven back to port. Japan had lost not a single battleship, aircraft carrier, heavy or light cruiser. It had gained resources of great importance, including 70% of the world's tin supply, most of its production of natural rubber, and the oil output of the Dutch East Indies, which at the time exceeded that of Iran and California combined. It had done this in a single onslaught fought as two campaigns. In Asia and in the Pacific. We will look first at the Asian offensive that conquered Hong Kong, Malaya, Singapore, Burma and the Dutch East Indies. The day after Pearl Harbor, Japanese aircraft operating out of Vietnam bombed Singapore and the Philippines was bombed by planes flying out of Taiwan. The new territories were invaded in the first part of the capture of Hong Kong 
and the two British capital ships in the area, Prince of Wales and Repulse, sailed from Singapore to contest Japanese landings on the Malay Peninsula. They had no air cover and on the 10th of December, both were sent to the bottom by waves of attacking Japanese aircraft. Thailand, then known as Siam, was occupied on December the 9th and formally allied itself with Japan on the 14th. Siam, another self-styled neutral who frequently announced her intention of defending herself against aggression, she too has given way. The Imperial Japanese Army could now march through Thailand en route to Burma, a journey that they would attempt to hasten by construction of the Burma-Thailand Railway, which was to become so notorious. On December the 15th, Japanese troops entered Burma. The full-scale invasion would be launched in January. On December the 16th, they landed in Borneo. On the 18th, they crossed onto Hong Kong Island. By the 7th of January, the Japanese had Sarawak. They landed on the Celebes a couple of days later, and British North Borneo fell on the 19th. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From uncovering ancient Neolithic cultures to the dawn of the space race, History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historian. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. This is a world war and none can tell how far it may spread. So the Dutch Empire in the Far East prepares. The Dutch East Indies, which generated one-seventh of the Netherlands' economy, was a particularly crucial objective of the Japanese campaign. Its annual production of 65 million barrels of oil had the potential to transform Japan's ability to wage a protracted war. But the Dutch destroyed the wells. On the Malay Peninsula, General Tomoyuki Yamashita's 25th Imperial Japanese Army was advancing. Yamashita, whose exploits would earn him the sobriquet Tiger of Malaya, had 150 tanks. They were not very good tanks, which did not matter. The British forces opposing him had no tanks at all. British defences, weakened by supply of resources to the war in Europe, crumbled. The Japanese advance through Malaya followed two lines, across the Thai border and down the west coast, and from the landings at Kotobaru following the east coast. The British in Malaya formed defensive lines but failed to extend their flanks. They had not learned the lesson of the German Blitzkrieg through the Ardennes, and just as on the European battlefield, their flanks were quickly turned by enemy troops infiltrating through supposedly impassable areas, in this case, the jungle. On December 31st, the last of the British and Commonwealth forces crossed the causeway, evacuating Malaya and garrisoning the island fortress of Singapore. The greatest disaster in British imperial history was less than two months away. By mid-January, the commander-in-chief of ABDICOM, the American-British-Dutch-Australian command, General Wavell, who had been kicked sideways from North Africa, was ordering Arthur Percival, the general officer commanding Malaya, to prepare Singapore for a siege. Before Singapore fell, Japanese forces working their way through the Dutch East Indies, present-day Indonesia, hopped from island to island, suppressing what resistance they found. Small garrisons of Dutch and other forces had been sent to defend some of these islands, but their position was hopeless, the planning rudimentary and their equipment inadequate. The fate of Gull Force, an Australian formation sent to support Dutch troops on the island of Ambon, was typical. Gulf Force reached Ambon on December 17th. 
just two weeks before the Japanese. There were only about 1,100 of us, and there would have been only about that many Dutch, Dutch-led Ambonese soldiers. So the action was very, very brief, and come end of January, early February, the Dutch capitulated, and because uh, Australians had no option but to do likewise. So that's when I became a prisoner of war. The survivors were marching into three years of harsh captivity. The first Japanese landing on Singapore on February the 8th occurred less than a week after the fall of Ambon. Four days later, a ship carrying Australian nurses and wounded evacuated from Singapore was bombed by Japanese aircraft and sank. Most of the survivors reached Bangka, an island like Ambon in the Dutch East Indies. An officer from their ship surrendered to the Japanese who ordered the 22 nurses and one civilian woman to wade into the surf. When they were waist deep, they were machine gunned. All but Sister Vivian Bullwinkle were killed. Sister Bullwinkle survived the war and gave evidence before the War Crimes Tribunal in Tokyo. Of the massacre, she said, we just marched into the surf and they fired at us. There were no tears, for we knew it was our lot. The day before the Banker Island massacre on the 15th of February, General Percival had surrendered the Singapore garrison of 130,000 troops to an invading army half that size. Facing a numerically superior enemy and having taken about the same number of casualties, 9,000, as the defenders, Yamashita's call on the British to surrender or face destruction was an enormous bluff. But General Arthur Percival, baggy shorts, scarecrow frame and trim moustache, perfectly designed to be the scapegoat for such a disaster, had mainly raw troops without air cover with which to meet battle-hardened Japanese. His concern for the safety of Singapore's one million civilians overrode any other judgment, and he marched into captivity at the head of his force, many of whom would suffer dreadfully in the years ahead. Yamashita could hardly believe his luck, and said so. As far as Japanese public opinion was concerned, the improbable collapse of the British Empire in the East meant, quite simply, victory. After the surrender of Singapore, the headline of the Asahi Shimbun newspaper trumpeted, Situation of Pacific War Decided, and the jubilant Japanese government distributed treats to all the children. <laughs> あの、with the fall of Singapore, 55,000 Indian soldiers of the king were taken prisoner. 40,000 of them volunteered to fight in the Indian National Army, a Japanese creation under the respected leader Subhas Chandra Bose, which purported to be fighting the British for Indian independence. Later in 1942, Winston Churchill was to say in a speech in London, I have not become the king's first minister, in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. But of course, he had. This war changed everything. End of the British Empire. They won the war, but they lost the empire. The pomp and circumstance by which a few thousand held several million in their sway had been exposed for the frail bluff it was. Singapore fallen. <laughs> <laughs>
The empire was on the canvas, and though it would rise again, it would be, as they say, as a dead man walking. The Japanese catch cry, we are all Asians, their claim to be on a crusade to evict the white man from Asia had immediate resonance. But like Hitler in Europe, the Japanese knew how to conquer but not how to keep an empire. Soon they were hated and resented more violently than had been the colonial masters. Taking food from Chinese mouths, taking Korean women into sexual slavery, using Filipinos for bayonet practice was hardly the way. But those they conquered would not return to the arms of their previous masters. When the fighting ended, there would be new paths to follow. The Dutch colonial government relocated to Australia at the beginning of March as the tsunami of Japanese conquest rolled through the East Indies, effectively collapsing the Dutch Empire. West from the Dutch Indies and from Malaya, the battle was for Burma, and that battle threatened to prise open the door to India. Japanese aircraft operating out of Thailand had launched the first bombing raid on the capital, Rangoon, on the 23rd of December. Japanese reinforcements arrived through January and began to press towards the capital. Mulmain, celebrated in the poetry of Rudyard Kipling, fell at the end of the month. We knew that we cannot sit on the frontier all the time. We have to go. This little feeling of the withdrawal from Burma was taken as a personal uh, touching point that we, after all, fought. But now nobody thinks we fought because we came back. And the feeling was that we must get a chance to at least settle with the Japanese that they are no, no better than us. The troops opposing the Japanese advance were mainly Indian divisions, which, combined with British units, comprised the Burma Army. In the north of the country were the Chinese 5th and 6th Armies, commanded by the American General Joe Stilwell, an astringent character known as Vinegar Joe. The Japanese entered Rangoon on March the 5th. Two weeks later, a new general was put in command of 1st Burma Corps. His name was William Slim. But the Japanese is a tough enemy, and much must be done before he will admit defeat. By the end of April, the Japanese had cut the Burma Road. General Stilwell began his march south to reunite with Allied forces. On May the 15th, he crossed into Assam in British India. Five days later, after the longest withdrawal in British military history, 1,000 kilometers, Bill Slim led Burma Corps across the border into India. The men looked, Slim said, like scarecrows, but, he added, they looked like soldiers too. We did not want the Japanese to come and take over India, because there was a general feeling that the Japanese will be much worse. One person is evil. But the other is even more evil. It has been said that the winter saved the Russians, and in Burma, the monsoon saved the British. It would be six months before the fight there was resumed. You
まだ家の中にいるサソリはね前を切ってええわいと思って「ああサソリや」言うたら捕まえたら尻尾でグーッてやって尻尾で刺されて半日やしびれ俺見てみいらんことするから見てサソリ刺しをたいて半日しびれてもてがねこうやって歩いてましたよ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。And it had met with a similarly great measure of success. Almost half of the Earth's water surface is the Pacific Ocean. It covers an area greater than all of the land masses combined. Its scale dwarfs the scattered parcels of dry land that rise above its waves. But it was the existence of these islands that made extending the co prosperity sphere into the Pacific feasible. Because a ring of fortified islands made the empire defensible. And at Versailles, some of those islands had been gifted to Japan. The Marshall, Carolines, and Marianas were former German colonies. Two American outposts upset the integrity of that defensive ring. They were Wake and Guam. Three days after Pearl Harbor, Japanese forces landed on Guam, which had surrendered by six o'clock the same morning. The first Japanese assault on Wake was beaten off by a well entrenched defense. Stronger attempt on December the 23rd succeeded, and Wake surrendered that day. The day before, December 22nd, the main Japanese landings on Luzon signaled the commencement of the battle for the Philippines. The American commander, General Douglas MacArthur, had 130,000 men in uniform. But 100,000 were Filipinos who had been trained in close order drill. They could salute, but had never been in a fight. MacArthur began to withdraw his forces by the 5th of January. He had successfully established one American and seven Filipino divisions, 80,000 men, at Bataan, where they came under sustained Japanese attack. By the 22nd of January, MacArthur was ordering the withdrawal of forces to his final defensive line, an operation completed on the 26th. On the 8th of February, Filipino President Quezon. Proposed to President Roosevelt that his country be granted complete independence so that he could proclaim Filipino neutrality, which he hoped would oblige both American and Japanese forces to leave. President Roosevelt, advocate of self determination in the Atlantic Charter, rejected Quezon's proposal but said that Filipino troops were free to surrender if they wished. He said that American forces would fight to the end. President Quezon left the Philippines on February the 20th. General MacArthur left on March the 11th. Both men went to Australia. The Japanese continued to reinforce their invasion, opening a fierce offensive against Bataan on April the 3rd. On the 9th of April, the Allied forces on Bataan surrendered. 78,000 men were marched into captivity. This was the Bataan Death March, more than 100 kilometers under the scorching sun with hardly any food or water. Amongst those who marched into captivity were 12,000 Americans, barely a third of whom would survive Japanese imprisonment. Fighting elsewhere in the Philippines, Mindanao, Luzon, Corregidor continued. But by the 5th of May, General Wainwright was obliged to surrender the 15,000 man garrison on Corregidor. Five days later, on May the 10th, the last Allied troops in the Philippines surrendered. Japanese troops had begun landing on New Guinea on March the 8th. Further landings followed, and on March the 22nd, Japanese planes bombed the northern Australian port city of Darwin. 
It was obvious that the Japanese were on their way to invade us, and everything was haste. And it was no trouble to get into the army, as long as you coughed okay, <laughs> and that uh, you could see black or white, you were in without any question. And at the time I got in, it was uh, a week before my 19th birthday. By the time Douglas MacArthur had established his command in Brisbane, the situation he faced was almost entirely black. Virtually the whole of the Southwest Pacific Command area was now in Japanese hands. Germany's first commitment that America had made at the Washington Conference meant that he had limited strength on which to rely. But one national leader, at least, was determined to face the Japanese challenge as an overriding priority. The full cabinet to die directed the war cabinet to gazette the necessary regulations for the complete mobilization of all the resources, human and material, in this Commonwealth for the defense of this Commonwealth. That means that every human being in this country is now, whether he or she likes it, at the service of the government to work in the defense of Australia. John Curtin, the Australian Prime Minister, exercised his right in a fiery confrontation with Churchill to withdraw Australian troops from the European war to fight the enemy on his doorstep. By March 1942, the majority of Australian troops were back home, ready to fight in the Pacific. In determining which strategy Japan should now follow, men in Tokyo had disagreed. Naval staff had pressed for occupation of the southern part of New Guinea from where action could be launched against New Caledonia, Fiji and Samoa, extending and strengthening the defensive perimeter and isolating Australia from United States support and supply. The combined fleet staff, led by Admiral Yamamoto, thought differently. It argued for drawing the American Pacific Fleet into a full-scale engagement, and so it believed, to its destruction. Fatally, but predictably, the result was a face-saving compromise. Both strategies would be adopted, which meant that both would be weakened. An invasion force to initiate the naval staff strategy assembled at Rabaul. On the 4th of May, the convoy sailed for Port Moresby, the key to New Guinea. Less than a week earlier, the American carriers Hornet and Enterprise had left Pearl Harbor with their battle groups bound for the Coral Sea. Two other carriers, Lexington and Yorktown, had sailed two weeks previously. On May the 4th, the Battle of the Coral Sea was initiated when Yorktown launched airstrikes against the invasion fleet from Rabaul. The next day, the main Japanese strike force built around the carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku entered the Coral Sea. The American and Japanese fleets engaged without significant results on the 7th, but around 0800 hours in the morning of May the 8th, the carrier forces located each other. The first time, those serving aboard ships in a naval action never saw their opponents. The Lexington was hit and abandoned, Shokaku disabled and forced to retire, and Zuikaku, Though undamaged, lost 40% of her air group. The consequences of all this were to be enormous. The fact that the Americans were obliged to withdraw would allow the Japanese to claim a victory, but it was a victory that compelled Japan to abandon plans for an invasion of New Guinea from the sea. Had they landed, they would have faced Australian defenders who were present in only brigade strength. The Japanese, as we will see, decided instead to take Port Moresby by an overland route. 
Admiral Yamamoto's argument for an alternative strategy had been strengthened by an action on April the 18th that did little damage and took only 50 lives. On that day, 16 specially adapted B-25 bombers had taken off from the carrier Hornet on a bombing raid over Tokyo. The raid is in the history books in the name of its commander, the Doolittle Raid. The aircraft did not have the range to return to the carrier, so they flew on to land in China, where most crashed. Crews that crashed into Japanese hands became prisoners of war. Three were shot by firing squad. Crews that crashed in China survived. But the real story was the impact on Japan. Bombs had fallen in Tokyo. Bombs had fallen close to the Imperial Palace. Bombs had threatened the life of the Emperor. The shock and shame of this cried out for a response from a military caste whose first duty was to defend the Emperor. Planning began for a counter-blow which would neutralize America's capacity to launch raids on the home islands. It was evident to Japanese planners that flights from the nearby Chinese mainland were a possibility, and so, on April 21st, only a couple of days after the Doolittle Raid, Japan's Chinese Expeditionary Army was ordered to knock out air bases in Chekiang and Kiangxi. By mid-May, the Chinese had been routed east of Chekiang. A second Japanese army advanced in late May, and by early July, the Expeditionary Army had met all of its objectives. Before then, in May, Yamamoto's moment had arrived. The action of the combined fleet would finally neutralize American naval strength in the Pacific and, importantly, deal with a small Hawaiian outlier that had provided cover for the carriers from which the Doolittle Raiders flew, a place 3,100 kilometers from the nearest continent in any direction. Midway. American codebreakers led by Commander Joseph Rochefort knew that the Imperial Japanese Navy was going to a place designated AF, but they didn't know where AF was. A false message sent from American HQ to the US fleet advised that Midway was running short of fresh water. Snapping at the trap, the Japanese relayed the message advising that AF was short of water. The US fleet had the key to the lock. AF stood for Midway, and the Imperial Japanese Navy was going there. Not much more than 60 ships were involved in the battle. Midway would not be decided by fleets of warships. It was the almost 500 aircraft that the opposing navies would use like long-range cannon that would settle the issue. The Battle of the Coral Sea ruled the carriers Zuikaku and Shokaku out of the attack on Midway. USS Yorktown, damaged in the same battle, was estimated to require three months for repair. But 1,400 workmen completed the work in two days, and she took her place with the American fleet. It takes many sorts of hero to win a war. The Japanese sent a diversionary force under Admiral Hosegaya north to the Aleutians, but Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, commanding Pacific Ocean areas, was not distracted. He ordered his forces to meet where he expected the main enemy blow to fall, at Midway. Task Force 16, Admiral Raymond Spruance, and Task Force 17, Admiral Jack Fletcher, sailed to their rendezvous with each other, with the Japanese, and with history. And they sailed to meet an enemy that, in every measurable sense, outgunned them. The battle opened on June the 4th when aircraft from Admiral Nagumo's first striking force attacked aircraft and installations on Midway itself. 
When the aircraft returned to the carriers, the Admiral decided to re-equip them with bombs rather than torpedoes and launch a second attack on the island. His fleet was, meanwhile, repelling American aircraft attacks. The Americans took significant losses with no hits. But not without effect. The carrier forces were somewhat dispersed, their fighter cover was operating at low altitude and flight decks were crowded with rearming and refueling aircraft. 1020, Admiral Nagumo gave the order to launch when ready. Within five minutes they would launch and the Admiral would stand on the brink of a great victory. They were, instead, five minutes that decisively changed the course of the battle and the war. On the first day, we uh, hit about 30 ships of all types, battleships, cruise stores, food transports. Second day, we hit the carriers. Uh, Any luck with them? Oh, yes. Locked right in there. <laughs> in those five minutes, Commander Wade McCluskey of the USS Enterprise's bombing 6 Squadron led his 37 dauntless dive bombers in from 14,500 feet in a 70-degree dive at 280 knots. The carrier Alonghi was the first hit, then Kanga, last Sorgu when Yorktown's dive bombers joined the assault. Japan lost four carriers, more than 2,000 seamen and 250 aircraft. This was not, in terms of human life, a terrible battle. In terms of influence on history, it was in the front rank. Japanese losses equalized the strength of the opposing fleets. Between 1942 and 1944, Japan would add six new fleet carriers, the USA, 14. In fact, through the war, for every major naval vessel built in Japanese shipyards, the Americans built 16. The news of Midway was passed to Prime Minister Tojo in typically obtuse language. The Navy, he was told by General Moritaki Tanabe, has made a great mistake. Japan lost no territory as a result of its mistake, but Midway's effects would be felt when, towards the end of 1943, the Americans began to prise open the defensive perimeter. Japan would have inadequate ships and, above all, aircraft. In 1942, Japan lost twice the number of aircraft it produced. As great naval forces clashed in the war's first significant turning point at Midway, the war in Western Europe was being confined almost entirely to the skies. Was for a long time the only means that Britain had of carrying the fight to her enemy. One third of Britain's national output was devoted to the strategic air offensive. When the war had started, bombing was conducted according to strict rules. In 1939, the Chamberlain government had rejected a suggestion that the Black Forest be bombed on the grounds that much of it was private property. But to point out the obvious, Desperate times call for desperate measures. Almost 150,000 Rolls-Royce Merlin engines were built. The V-12 power plant drove some of the most famous planes of the war. Spitfire, Hurricane, Mosquito, Mustang, and the four-engined Avro Lancaster. The Lancaster was a true heavy bomber. Its bomb load of 6.35 metric tons overshadowed the B-17 Flying Fortress and the German Heinkel 111 and Junkers 88, all of which carried between two and three tons. By general ascent, the best night bomber of the war, the Lancaster was not without faults. Because of poorly placed escape hatches, the average survival rate for the seven-man crew of a disabled Lancaster was 1.3 persons. For the less glamorous Halifax, it was 2.45. The Avro Lancaster, 
most powerful and efficient bomber in the world, and one of the most important war-winning weapons yet devised by the United Nations. The Lancaster entered service with Bomber Command of the Royal Air Force at the same time as the G radio navigation device came into use. Such developments encouraged the RAF to redefine its bombing strategy. On February the 14th, 1942, the Area Bombing Directive was issued. It named the Ruhr, and specifically Essen, in the middle of that conurbation, as primary targets, with Duisburg, Dusseldorf and Cologne as other cities to be attacked. The, the bomber offensive undoubtedly was a major con contribution to, us, to, to our winning the war, no doubt about that, but it was a pretty ruthless business. To drive home the strategy, a new head of Bomber Command was appointed. Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris, one of the most controversial Allied commanders. If you individually succeed, you will have delivered the most devastating blow against the very vitals of the enemy. Let him have it right on the chin. Send that message to all groups and stations. That was how Air Marshal Harris, Commander-in-Chief Bomber Command, gave his instructions for the largest air raid the world has ever known. At aerodromes up and down the country, well over a thousand British-built bombers were being prepared for their journey over the heart of Germany's biggest... Harris was given a job. It was to deliver on the objective of the Area Bombing Directive, and that document explained that the purpose of dropping bombs was... They don't know what they're dropping when they drop them bombs. I don't care what anybody says, because I saw what it was. They bombed everything. Especially in Nuremberg, when I finally wound up in Nuremberg, the lower Nuremberg was level. And the top of Nuremberg, that was pretty well level too. It, it was pathetic to see all that. And then you see the old people, the old lady getting the bricks and knocking the cement off. They were ready to rebuild. They knew they lost the war, but they weren't gonna lose their lives, you know? Focus attacks on the morale of the enemy's civil population, and in particular, industrial workers. Area bombing remains perhaps the most controversial of all of the military strategies of the war. Pre-war projections both stimulated expenditure on bombers and advocacy of their use. Official British planning was based on a projected casualty rate of 50 casualties per tonne of bombs dropped. In the event, the death toll for the London Blitz was one per tonne, and the overall death toll in Germany was half that. As early as 1941, even Winston Churchill was beginning to doubt the prophecies about the effectiveness of bombing. It is very disputable, he said, whether bombing by itself will be a decisive factor in the present war. Essen was first attacked on the night of the 8th, 9th of March, and then on March the 28th, 9th, the RAF attacked Lübeck. 234 aircraft attacked, 13 were lost, Lübeck was virtually lost. Lübeck was a port where engines for U-boats were manufactured. It was also an historical, medieval, beautiful city, and it was laid waste. In retaliation, Hitler ordered attacks on British cities that qualified as targets because they were beautiful. All they had in common was prominence in tourist guides like the Bedecker, and indeed, the raids became known as the Bedecker Raids. A raid on Augsburg with heavy losses persuaded Harris to abandon daytime bombing, and from late April, Bomber Command flew by night. Rostock was attacked to great effect, and at the end of May, Cologne was hit in the first 1,000 bomber raid. The operational order was succinct object to destroy the city of Cologne. Barely two days later, almost as great a number hit Essen and at the end of June, Bremen was the target. Harris was, until the very end of the war, unshakable in his belief that bombing would bring Germany to her knees, that the disruption to industry and the effect on civilian morale, victims of what was euphemistically called de-housing, would hasten the end of the war.
area bombing had the advantage that it did not depend on accurate bomb aiming, which various reports had proved was beyond the reach of current equipment. The Butt Report, analysing the effectiveness of Bomber Command's actions in the summer of 1941, had found that only one in four bombers had dropped their loads within eight kilometres of their targets. On nights when there was no moon, it was only one in 20. In fact, in 1941, Bomber Command had suffered more casualties than it had caused. Crews dying, as the British military historian Sir John Keegan put it, largely to crater the German countryside. They had not arranged for people who had done their 30 operations to come back and say to us, now, fellas, this is the sort of thing that you've got to protect yourself against. If you maintain your height at about, say, 7,000 feet or 10,000 feet, that'll be about the best protection you can get. But they didn't do that. All we had was just raw recruits doing bombing raids on Germany. A mistake to suppose that the bombers were attacking defenceless civilians. The cities were well defended. Indeed, anti-aircraft defense tied up one million German service personnel. And although it represented only 7% of British military manpower, Bomber Command took 24% of British military deaths. As we came out of the target area, I got caught in this beam. I thought of it a thousand times since as to what I did. I had absolutely no doubt I should have just remained at the same height and flew and kept on changing course. But instead of that, I attempted to get out of the beam by increasing my speed. And I did that by diving. Got free of the beam, but it wasn't very long before the retail gunner was reporting that we were being attacked. A night fighter. Again, I had to take whatever evasive action I thought was appropriate. Again, it was diving. And as a result of this, of course, I lost, lost all my height. I thought I was flying at somewhere about 500 feet. And so that, I hit a tree. <laughs> I can remember the two of the crew coming around and saying, come on, Cole, you've got to get out of here. <laughs> and that's what I did. The bomb aimer, who was in front of me, and the wireless operators, they were killed in the crash. And that left three of us. The morality of area bombing continues to be debated and its targeting of civilian populations without regard to age or gender has led to comparisons with the criminal slaughter of the Holocaust. Of course, bombing involved the risks of war. It was not a cowardly assault on defenseless civilians. Tens of thousands of Allied airmen lost their lives. Surely the compelling distinction dividing the death camps from the bomb sites is that all sides used area bombing because all sides believed that it could and would be a war-winning weapon. No one outside the heart of Nazism has ever pretended that killing Jews, Romani, Slavs and others was going to affect the outcome of the war. In the next episode of The Price of Empire, two further turning points mark what Winston Churchill called the end of the beginning. The defeat of Rommel at El Alamein and the fate of the Wehrmacht, savaged by a red army red in tooth and claw at a place called Stalingrad. <laughs>